Well, hello, Kingdom Living community. Welcome back. It has been a little tiny break because Jessie has been on assignment um, in <laughs> Michigan as she just did the Eyes Wide Open conference. And then she was down in Austin doing a decode there. And so she is back. And stay tuned and keep your eyes on the website, kingdomlivingwithjessie.com. For the next upcoming conferences and there will be a really awesome opportunity for more decodes coming up in saint augustine that is the 19th and 20th of this month and then there will also be another opportunity in maine in mid-june so make sure that you're keeping your eyes peeled on the website for dates and specifics because they are both quickly approaching and today before we get going make sure that you have plenty of note paper and plenty of pens. I always go through like five pens, which is <laughs> teaching. They keep running out because there's just so much. But today is so important for so many of you. And uh, today's episode is going to be a prep and a teaching for a subsequent episode um, this Sunday on riding the storms. Um, but uh, just to head back to just to head back to a couple couple notes, is also this weekend, uh, Jesse is starting a new book club with Aquarius Rising Africa on their Patreon for her new book, Foundations of Kingdom Living. So if you have that book, if you're going to get it, pick it up, then you can join them 9 a.m. Eastern this Sunday. That will start. And today's episode rise up is the taking of the key of knowledge and this is going to be very important because of the decoding that jesse is going to be doing she's going to be using the whiteboard today so we're going to have a little gonna fun give it a have, try. <laughs> have some grace for her and what she is doing because you know all know how fun it is to try to you know use an electronic pen of some sort and so the decoding that she's going to do today, if you really want to get in depth, you're going to see this kind of thing at, at a greater level um, in St. Augustine. Those that went to Austin got a good taste of this. And so pay attention today because this is going to prep you uh, for a deliverance uh, session here in the next episode. So the taking of the key of knowledge, Jesse. Oh my goodness. All right. Give, oh, give me one second here. I'm figuring this out. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking about really, you know, that we're covering and I encourage if you get a chance to go to one of the decode tours, it's really worth it because I really break down, um, the different symbols, the different uh, things that the system uses and, you know, what are their meanings? What are they using it for? Um, they're always communicating in a language that really um, they consider a secret knowledge and a hidden knowledge. It It's something that isn't going to be passed down or, um, you know, in written form, it usually was passed down orally so that was part of how they kept it so secret for so long is that, you know, you would only know the proper pronunciations of the written form if you had heard those pronunciations. So that's how they kind of get away with that. And one of the key words that um, that comes out of this as we begin to look, and this is going to be a uh, Hebrew word, and that is the Hebrew word kalad. And you have, that's made out of three, oops, that one's not working. Hold on. Let's ignore that part. <laughs> let me to learn to write this. Let me see, is there an eraser? All right, let me try that. Um, as we look at this, you know, the Hebrew word kalad is, um, is important because what it means is a key. Okay. And this really is part of the key to their hidden knowledge is that they're using Hebrew. You know, that's one of their base languages. 
And as we begin to look at the Golden Dawn, um, I really don't, this is one, you know, we've talked about in the system how you've got some books that are reflection books, uh, but you have other books that, you know, they use for summoning and for, you know, teaching, uh, twisting their deceptions, their um, untruths, their falsehoods. So I really don't encourage you to um, read the books, but kind of what I'm doing is going through what were some of the books that I went through within this system as a child. Um, what are some of the symbols that, you know, they use or, or the things that terms that they use out of those books that are important for us to understand in the overall generality of how the Luciferian Brotherhood and Sovereign Military make their contracts with principalities and how we can understand as we're, you know, decoding our areas, um, what the different symbols and signs mean and how that then connects to contracts that you know our quadrant and regional leaders in the brotherhood have made on our behalf and which principalities they've made those contracts to you know how can we go against a strong man if we don't know who that strong man is right and so you know that's part of why I'm teaching this because we do have authority over our areas. God has given us that authority. He secured it for us as we are a kingdom of priests under the headship of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to get into that today because even that is one of their biggest lies. Um, you know, they have the knowledge, they have the keys, they have the actual proofs and truths. They can prove who the Messiah is, yet they've refused to do so. They've kept that truth to themselves. So we're going to start actually here with a verse as we get into this, and we'll get back to Kalad the key. Uh, Tracy, if you would read uh, Luke, is it 1152? Yeah, that is the one. Luke 11. We're going to go all the way to 52. Luke eleven fifty two. What sorrow awaits you, experts in religious law, for you remove the key to knowledge from the people. You don't enter the kingdom yourselves, and you prevent others from entering. Or in the translation that you have, it's woe to the lawyers. <laughs> yes, woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves. And them that were entering, you hindered. So what are these different keys of knowledge? And this goes back to, um, you know, the cough and the Lamed combination. When you see um, stuff for the Golden Dawn, you'll primarily see this word. Um and you'll see different variations of it. And, oh, actually, let me see if I can just erase this. Let me, I forget that I can type and that's going to be easier than. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? You were so brave. To, <laughs> to I was this. trying my best. All right. So, <laughs> Tracy, if you saw that word, what would you, like, what would be your how do you think you would pronounce that? You're like, what? A Q and L? What sound does that yeah, make? Yeah, it, it, it seems like it would be like clip off or, well, yeah, it would have to be like a like a K sound or something, clipothic. Uh, yeah, I, I would have no idea. It actually makes an H sound. It actually it is. H yeah, it's where they get their word hypoth or hypothic. And we think of like, you know, hypothic oaths. Um, that's what they call their os that they go through are the hypothetic os. And and so we think about that. Who else makes hypothetic os? Is that the same as the Hippocratic, like the medical community oath, the Hippocratic right? oath? 
right kind of doing no harm sort of thing yeah, yeah. Huh. exactly right light side of the system they you know may not in all earnesty they may not if they haven't grown up you know being an active part of the system they may have no knowledge that really it's this oath to the hidden knowledge um mm -hmm. that they bear and that their job is to always cover that or keep that silent uh, so as we go through this, like, you know, one of the things that comes out of that is that you have um, with their contracts, they have a name of uh, their God that um, it's the Keb M. Peckett here uh, pronounced differently. But that is the God that sat under Horus that. Uh, they, oh, let me see if I can get back here. Uh, the God that sat under Horus, that they, um, that represents their God of silence. And often, you know, you'll see the statues of that God, uh, lowercase g with the finger over the lip, indicating the silence there. Um, so that's, that's key to understand and so just for just for all those that are watching is that is that where the whole like where that whole silence thing comes from that the the celebrities are seen doing is that basically the origin of all of that stuff correct it's going to okay. be you know connected to that silent uh sign or worship that indicates a, a hidden principality or authority that you know, they take the oath that guards their lips and stuff. Oh so, my goodness. So total blaspheme of scripture. It's because the Holy Spirit puts the guard. Correct. On our mouths. And wow. Okay. Okay. Yep. The Holy Spirit puts the guard. So one of the biggest uh, things that we'll see in, and over here, um, can you see on the side or like the Rosicrucian cross, or are you just seeing the whiteboard? Just seeing the whiteboard right now. So okay. you may have to swap it. Okay. So some of the signs that they use, um, we see will be a triangle, like on the fronts of their books, you'll see a tr triangle. Um, oops, wrong way. Uh, sometimes we'll see um, an upside down triangle. And what these represent are, you know, the one represents what they consider the Holy Trinity, which you have, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you see it upside down for them, it represents the unholy Trinity. So you can know, like, if you see these signs in, you know, the outward signs of um, the buildings like sometimes you'll see a random triangle in a brick uh, for a Catholic church. Um, you know, pay attention to which way it goes. Uh, that will tell you if that place is considered, you know, the Holy Trinity, there's going to be that guise, that form of godliness. Uh, the unholy Trinity, you know, there, you're not going to have that form of godliness there. Uh, that cover, you uh, you know, all things are game in that place. And, you know, you can be unholy in that place. So, you know, when you, you'll see in their images and in their books that what are these things? These are seals. Okay. Now a seal is something that they use to mark and all of their books, you'll see something, you know, marked on the front and really it's the core of the magic they're engaging in. What is the magic that they're engaging in? Um, it's going to go back to the combination of these two images, um, which is what? What do you have hmm. when you combine those two things? Yeah, it looks like the, what, the Star of David, right? Right. The star of David or the sign of Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So you're going to be getting into things that they consider coming out of um, 
you know, Solomon and Israel, the things, mm -hmm. the hidden truths that come through Israel. Um, so they'll get further into that. But, you know, as we look at this, uh, they'll use some of these things to, again, like bring forward their hidden truths. Uh, these are considered, you know, geometrical shapes. They actually prove things, um, you know, so they're proofs. So when you see this, oftentimes in their literature, you'll see this first triangle with several Hebrew letters. Now, this top letter, um, they often will not put like you'll only get that in places where they're they're showing it but they won't really show you what it means okay so what we would see is we would see um the name of god ascending and descending in hebrew so we would see the yod the hey then mm -hmm. we see this thin shin uh this is the only uh double uh letter in hebrew and you pronounce it like based on the dots that will be on top. So how I remember is that sin is never right. So when you see the dot, like when you see the dot over here on the left, then you would pronounce it with an S sound. And when you see the dot on the right, you would pronounce it with an SH. Okay. So it's the only double portion letter in Hebrew um, that has two pronunciations. You do have where dots can be applied to other ones where it will soften the letters. So like you have the bait. If there's a dot in there, instead of a B sound, it will make a V sound. But this is this letter actually has two portions. So then you got the rest of Yahweh, which is the He or the Vav and the a second He. Okay. Now, oftentimes you'll just see, you know, the name of God ascending, descending without this uh, Sin Shin here. So when we look at this, you know, there's deeper truths that they have here that they are not releasing to the public. Um, when we first look at this, you know, what can that represent? Um, that can represent the mountain of God and ascending up the mountain, descending down the mountain. And we see that, you know, you have Yahweh whose throne is above every other throne. Um but we're going to get deeper into that because, you know, if this is Yahweh, what happens when we add that shin here? We get Yeshua. They literally have the name of the Messiah in their teachings, Yeshua, whose name oh is gosh. above every other name. Yeshua's, Jesus. which is exactly what scripture tells us, that his name shall be called Jesus you know, in English, because his name is above every other name. So let's read a couple verses on that. Why don't you start um, with that, uh, with yeah, the, the first verse that we had there. Sure. Um, which, let me see. I, I'm, I'm in Philippians 2 right now. Yep. Therefore, God elevated him to the high, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, continuing in 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And 11, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God, the Father. And so think about this, you know, that literally is a double portion here. What they will do is they will um, mirror this, and this is where we get, you know, the diamond oh, shape that I often yeah. use. And so in the same way, ascending, you have yaw. And here you have, again, the shin. 
and then you have um, the vav and the he, and so both in the heavens and to the lowest depths, you have literally, as it says, the Holy Spirit hovers above mm -hmm. and below, right? So you have the Spirit of God with Yeshua who hovers above and below. Um, so we're going to get into, you know, some more on this. Uh, go ahead and read uh, Isaiah, the Isaiah 9 verse there, what it says about, oh, why won't that one right. erase? Um, verse 6, for, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yep. So unto us. And so when we look at this, why is this a hidden key? It's because literally the name uh, of God has been given to us as an inheritance. Um, this is why in the book of Exodus, it says, do not take his name in vain, because literally, it, you know, all through scripture, it says that he is our portion. He is our inheritance. And right here in this, what do we see about the name of Yahweh and Yeshua? We literally see the geometrical and mathematical proof that God is one. Oh. You have both Yahweh and Yeshua one. Therefore, when Jesus says the father and I are one, I believe that those um, Pharisees and Sadducees who knew these keys and truths, that they knew exactly what he was saying. They knew that he was proclaiming, I and the Father are one. And they knew that he was God come in the flesh. Um, you have, when you look at the Hebrew here, we talked about how that Yod represents the carrying of the light or the glory, right? Um the carrying of lifting up of the glory of the light through uh, the first fruits. You have that hay represents the first fruits. So through the first fruits of the one who carries the double portion of fruits that are not, they don't like you don't have where it produces another in a way like another tree that bears the same kind like literally it is the tree that holds the fruit and you can eat from it but you're not going to have it replicating the tree itself yet all who eat from that tree are going to have exactly what that tree, um we see that same example in the tree of knowledge that it, it carried the fruit of good and evil it didn't produce more trees that either bore fruit of good or fruit of evil yet everybody who ate from that tree had that knowledge of good and evil so it's kind of the same concept that all who partake in that fruit that christ has to give shall have life they'll have life abundant but they're you know not going to be able to go out and produce more christ there's only one christ and that's Jesus Christ, um, you know, and so you have he who bears the fruit unto life and then to the flesh that Vav often represents man or the flesh shall have fruit, shall produce fruit. So you literally have a gospel message within this geometrical proof of exactly what Christ came to do, both you know, to carrying his light to the, in the heavens, in the high place. And you also, when you mirror that, you have him carrying that light to the depths, right? Yes. Now in this, we also have, you know, what is Isaiah, that verse in Isaiah nine say, let's read that one again. Let me go on back over there. That was the, for under as a child is born. Nanda's son is given and his name shall be called 
wonderful count. Hopefully I'm not messing it up. I'm sorry, people. Okay, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And is that the first part? Does it say, and the government shall rest on his shoulders? Oh, yes. That go in, in verse seven is government and its peace will never end. He oh, I I apologize. That is in verse six for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful. Okay. Counselor, so we had God. Isaiah yeah. nine verse six. Verse six. Mm -hmm. Right. So we know that the government rests on his shoulders, which that truth is right here in this symbol. You have, you know, you have this government almost like a mantle resting on the shoulders or the arms, right? And so as that government rests, like that has to do with the Holy Spirit who takes that place of resting uh, either temporarily or permanently. When the Holy Spirit rests permanently, we see a structure placed. Um, like in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle then it became a temple or a house. So think about this, that literally it shows Jesus Christ and that sin shin representing the wings of the dove of the Holy Spirit resting on this place, whether it's the high place that's above every other place or whether it's that point of the neck that goes over the shoulders you have the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, that rests in that place. Now, one of the things that in the system they will do um, to bypass that and, and think about this, this is their symbology that we'll see. We'll see the symbology of a spade, okay, a shovel. And what they will what that represents they'll also show it as like these these series of dots that um represent the thorax which is the place in the back of the neck oh. um so that point where you know your shoulders and the back of your neck connect to the head and what they'll do is right at that place, like when they do their prayers, they literally will put the Bible or their hand, like usually it'll be like the Bible on the back of that thorax area and they'll bend somebody down, like so you're facing down and they'll put that Bible on the back of the thorax. That's a sign that, you know, your pastor or the men who are praying in your church our brotherhood. It usually it'll be a white Bible that they'll place on the back. It could be a black one too, I guess, but um, they'll put it on the back and that's because they're putting another word, a false word on the place, a false cornerstone on the place that belongs only to God or Jesus. Like, you know, the men are to wear the head covering and in prayer, they would wear those mantles, which represented- oh my goodness. The spirit of God. So they put a false thing. So think about that, right? What in in the Old Testament, what do we see representing that covering or mantle before God? We see a cloth, right? Mm -hmm. A prayer cloth or a headpiece. That's what God assigned. But what do they assign over it? They sign over it usually the King James Version of the bible and literally put that false word over the back of the neck to take a headship and authority at that capstone place so that's one of the things that they will do um yet they know the truth and this is why the lord gets so angry and says to them woe to you lawyers for you have taken that key of knowledge and you entered not in yourself. They don't enter into a true relationship with Jesus Christ, who has all authority, all power, and who's able to give that authority and that power out as an inheritance. But they take false authorities and false um, 
you know, false images, false symbols. And he says, and to them that were entering in, you hindered, you know, so they, they attempt to sway people with a form of godliness, but really, you know, it keeps us from being in that relationship. Um, again, what do they do with that law or that word of God that they push? Um, you know, they pers push perfectionism that you have to memorize all the scripture. You, you know the truth, but really you just have this form of godliness because you're not allowing the spirit of God to move. You become the one who's in charge and dictating and governing um, based on the laws, the traditions, the regulations versus allowing the Lord to bring you to that place of truth and living it, living the word in truth, because everything that comes from Christ, it's living word. It, it has life and it's going to, what's the end result is that, you know, that Christ, when he moves, when he carries that word through to the man it's going to produce living fruit that's what we see out of god's name everything will produce living fruit versus what are these symbols why do they have a spade that's why i wanted to ask is you know what does it you know. represent this is or here let me do it this way sorry i'm trying to go back and forth you are um, doing great with this <laughs> what do they what does this represent it represents That's death, the, the grave digger spade. Um, you know, so we see, we see the difference, like, what are they doing with that truth? They're only producing death, dead fruit, fruit that doesn't bear unto life. It's based on works. And, um, you know, those works are, are based in, um, let's see if I can, yeah, so you've got death, you've got works, and you've got dead fruit because uh, no movement of the Spirit of God. So that's where you end up with that. Um, so in that, you know, mm -hmm. it's so important to understand that this is behind their beliefs, that anybody who's entering into you know, beginning to start their degrees and elevating towards the order of Melchizedek, which, you know, the order of Melchizedek is, is the top government um, within the Luciferian Brotherhood. Um, within that, you know, you're going to have a department that literally initiates people into that order of Melchizedek, and that's the Mormons. Um, you know, they take those oaths and vows, but they're not the only ones, you know, but they are directly initiating into that order. You also have the Golden Dawn who are going to be initiating into that order. And I really feel like the, the Golden Dawn are more of the administrative side of the Luciferian Brotherhood. They've been the keeper of these symbols and you know, teaching the different symbols across um, across the board to those departments based on, you know, what are they programming within that department? What are the positions they're training um, and programming for? And what knowledge do they want held in that department? Um, you know, what contracts are that department responsible to maintain? You know, basically they've set up the five departments, the Masons, the Jesuit Catholics, the Mormons, uh, the Satanists and the Kabbalah to be keepers of contracts with principalities. Now, so, as we get in, uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. One quick second, just for anybody who is, kind of super new to the way these things work. Like when you're, when you're talking about the contracts, like you were, you are talking about a, like basically a business contract of if you do this, I will do that. And here's our handshake on like between 
one of these groups and whatever principality that there is the other side of the contract right. like that's okay okay yep Good. so so with these contracts like what you know what we really have to understand again is that they are for the high places as well as the low places uh both in the physical and the spiritual realm and what they do is you know they will put use that name of god yah and then the way but here at the capstone they place something else now we see the main contract for placing uh right within our own oval office um you see it on the door frames which uh the door frame is considered a place where threshold covenants would take place. So you'd have the threshold down here at the bottom, but you also have a threshold up on top. And the contract that's marked on that threshold of our Oval Office is an X. Now, unless you know the sigils for the principalities, you're like, well, who who is that? You know, we know that there's nine major principalities that, you know, we've talked about with this diamond shape, you know, up at the 12 o'clock, you have a main one, then you have Ball, you have Molech, um, you have uh, Bephomet, Leviathan, uh, over here you have Azazel, you have Toth, and you have Samael with Ashtaroth being in the middle. Okay, so, you know, who has that top contract within our government and the military? Well, just breaking down a piece of his, now, what you have to understand about the principality sigils is you're going to have several contracts written within their name. So the, the main contract um, in this guise looks like, this and this represents several different contracts you have the x here then you have a long extending arm which we see that in the sovereign military we see that symbol okay and what does that represent a, a supreme preceptor somebody who has supreme rule within a regional area um and we see this half moon shape a crescent moon now that's different than the one we see it also turned this way uh often looking like a you know arab and forgive me this is really bad this is supposed to be an arab sword <laughs> <laughs> uh where do we see that with a woman or a rose on top we see that in the shriners okay so we see that same symbol uh when we see it like this it represents that is the sign of the Lions Club. Lions Club, like, like Lions the, Club, yep, like, like the Lions Club. Do. Yep. Good or like. hidden contract sign. You see the Lions Club now. Oh my goodness. Which principality has contracts with all of these groups? So we got the Supreme Preceptors. We've got the Shriners, and we've got the Lions Clubs, um, which we know are really engaged with the Boys and Girls Clubs and, you know, connected to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Kiwanis Clubs. But what what principality is that his sigil? That's Abaddon. Okay. So the other thing with this, though, is that, you know, this is authority over abysses. Um, because they put Abaddon here in this capstone place at the 12 o'clock. And so the main abyss then is one that he shares. You'll see that sigil uh, like that looking like a line. And that is the contract between Abaddon, Ashtaroth, and uh, Leviathan. And in their symbology, you'll see that as the the tree 
or the man with the woman on top uh, with, representing the Kabbalah tree. Now we see that even in his, but they switch because what does the V usually represent the chalice or the female, right? And then we see the man underneath and mm -hmm. therefore you have that contract uh, with Abaddon written all there in their end time events where you would have a woman in that place of what they consider raw. And forgive me, I'm really bad at drawing all this stuff. <laughs> I'm trying You're doing so a good hard. Job. I'm really trying here. You'd have the woman in that headship spot, okay? And then you would have the man in that lower spot that they consider the more feminine, which would be the moon. Um, so all of those contracts are written within our own buildings and, um, you know, other places we've, we've seen it now where the little birdie that sang changed its name. We also see this in project X, which, uh, was the project directly connected to Greenbrier um, out of Virginia. And that was one of the key governmental places where they go to make contracts as well as, you know, engage in other things within the system. So all of that, um, you know, is what they put in the place of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet they want us to accept these things, you know, to kind of not even notice that they're putting all these other signs and symbols um, around us. They don't want us to know what these contracts mean. Um, but literally, you know, within our Oval Office, uh, within Greenbrier, uh, these contracts are are displayed. Um, you know, Project X, uh, I've talked about how the U.S. military in the books that they would use in the reports, they literally put these signs and sigils so that those at the upper level know which principalities um, are being contracted. Um, now, we also see um, other hidden contracts that we'll get into later um, that get into their books. So let me, I'm going to erase some of this here. As we begin to look further into this and get into the different um, symbols and contracts, you know, we really see what they're trying to I'm oh, sorry, I guess I got to erase all at once because I don't want to erase the whole board. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. Um, you know, what's the purpose of, of knowing all this? It's because when we know we can stand in our authority in Christ and we have the authority to break these contracts to say, you know what? No, not in my area. Uh, scripture says, if you want to go into the strong men's house, uh, first, you know, you have to remove bind the him. strong man. You have to bind <laughs> him. And so, uh, you know, what is the binding? What are we binding? Binding is a word that is used um, also with words. You know, we have, if we have the authority to bind and loose in the heavens and the earth, that means that we have the authority to bind these words, to render them useless. We also have the authority to loose um, the proper uh, words or contracts, which one of those, uh, why don't you go ahead and read Ephesians 2.6. That contract is, a, that contract speaks of what is our, what is the authority that has been given to us in Jesus Christ? For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. That's right. We are united with him. And, um, and with that, you know, when we have confessed our sins and we've received Christ as our Lord 
that is important term to remember. Why don't you quick find that verse that says, um, you know, we know that his name is above every other name, but we also know that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So when we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord, we've died with him and he has raised us to new life in him. Literally, when we are raised, you know, like I use the same symbology that when we have died with Christ, we're raised to new life and we are secured in that name, which is a tower about us. It's that, that um, you know, place where we can find safety, but also where we can dwell. Like when we look at the inner part of this triangle, we're able to dwell within his name, literally. And, you know, Psalm 91 speaks of that, that those who... Um, dwell in the secret place, shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So when we think of this as his arms, his shoulder, where is his sh shadow? It's underneath his arms. Um, it's an actual location where we can dwell within his name. Yeah. All right, so go ahead and share that verse if you found that. Well, I wasn't exactly sure which one you were looking for, but I was looking at uh, in in Romans six that uh, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So even mm -hmm. though it wasn't directly we were looking for, it's like that's where that's where our life is and where it's from and we're right. in him. Um, but there's another scripture in Colossians about being hidden, hidden in Christ, hidden in Christ. Uh -huh. Right. And, the Father. and, uh, but were you referring back to Philippians to the nine? Lord? Um, the verse about, um, Christ being the Lord, uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay. That's what we're, okay. So let's quick look that up here. I think uh Revelation think 17 14. Oh Revelation 17 14. Okay. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because He is Lord of all lords and King of all kings, and He and His called and chosen and faithful ones will be with Him. Right. So think about this: like if this even you know what this all represents, like it literally represents a resting place. So even in that, we have, you know, we know that when it talked about the sacrifices. In the Old Testament, you would often have the two lambs placed on the altar. Uh, one would be sacrificed and the other would be set free. Um, you know, one representing the, the scapegoat, the other representing the living sacrifice that is offered as the first fruit. So both the sacrifices, you know, that were to be made by Cain and Abel. Um, the one sacrificed the sheep to death, the other was to sacrifice something for life. Um, but in that you have, you know, it says that they will make war with the lamb, you know, the one who's up here, you even have the, it could be besides the wings of the dove, the two horns of the, the lamb, right? And it says that the lamb will conquer them because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Um, so, you know, there's just so much in these verses when we really look at the different, you know, the depth, the height, the breadth, the width of the things that have been given to us um, by the Lord and when we really understand those things. So, so we know that, you know, there's hidden knowledge. We know that they're making contracts. 
Um, we see those contracts everywhere we go, uh, even to the extent, you know, when we see uh, the polls, we've talked about, you know, what do, what was Israel known to place in those high, at that, you know, in the high places, they would put those two poles, one being the pole to Baal and the other, the pole to Ashtaroth. Now, we, why do Masons mark their sacred spot? Um, you know, with a rectangular or square floor. You know, literally they will, let me draw it a little better, literally in these spaces, you know, they, they create this checkered floor here representing that sacred space and just because it's turned and it has checkers, we don't recognize it. But this is the same diamond shape that they use to represent the perfectly squared man and there's sacred space that they're going to summon through, right? Why? Because it, it represents this point, you know, right here in the diamond. And instead of putting, you know, Christ's name being lifted up, what do they lift up? They put those two columns, one representing the ball pole, uh, also called also called the Boaz or the Hermes, the other representing the Ashtaroth pole, which is also called um, the the Joachim or the Solomon. And they'll put their symbols, you know, you could have a star or a circle up here. Um, just imagine this is a, a sun. Uh, I meant sun, not star. So you could have the sun there and you'll have the, the moon here over this one representing the male and the female. And that enter, you know, represents then the place of ascending to that highest place of godhood. Um, so that's what they're replicating. And that was the place that Lucifer wanted to ascend. Um, you know, let's look at that verse. Uh, it's in Isaiah where he says, I will. Let me that's see Isaiah, I that's 14, I think. Yeah. Yep. Isaiah 14. <laughs> and there's, you get uh, the five uh, assertions, uh, 13. Isaiah 14, 13 through 15. Uh, this is the accusation that was, you know, the Lord had against uh, Lucifer, Satan. Go ahead and read 13 through 15. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Exactly. So right here in that place is where they place an altar. Now that altar is also considered a throne. And so you have basically, you know, they will put a throne here, um, They'll put a throne here and here and one there. And what do those thrones represent? You know, they will call it the, it, and see if you can pronounce this word. That is a K. <laughs> oh, but I forgot to, I should have just typed it out. Um, okay. So how would you, how do you think you would say that word? It looks like it's like Kerbic, Kerbic, right? Cherubic. In e in English, we would say cherubic, right? So, what are the cherubic or the four faces, the four directions? We see that in Revelations. Oh, goodness, yeah. Uh, we see the face of, you know, we've got the face of the eagle, mm -hmm. the face of the, um the lion, the man, and the uh, soul. Okay, but all of those represent thrones that they set up. 
And these thrones are for contracts or authorities. Um, you've got both to the heights in the heavens, which they don't, they were cast down from that. So they don't have the authority over the heights or the heavens. What they do have the authority uh, over that they've taken is the authority over the abysses. Um, they don't have the keys to the abysses, but they, except for the one, I believe, but the, the system does not have that key. A certain individual will be given that key and the authority to open that abyss. But in that you have where they make um, contracts to the abysses that are in the north, the south, the east, and the west. So that's something that if you've been connected within the brotherhood or the system uh, or, or the golden dawn, uh, Rosicrucians, um, you know, those orders specifically will make those contracts to those abysses. And those are actual thrones that they believe that they sit on, you know, to the lower realm. And Quick so question, Jesse. I, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you, but the, but the, 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 the abysses and the north, south, east, west, and everything. Does that does that connect specifically to that position on that altar? Is that a representation of the corners of that altar? Well, no. What you have is you end up with the altar in that direction. Uh, so you have an altar in the north, an altar in the east and altar in okay. the south and altar in the west okay but where okay. the that contracts is... are made is they'll use ribbons and the contracts are made at the corners oh. so oh, okay. therefore see how when they do that you end up again with that sign of israel mm -hmm. wow yep Thank so you. I really get into that. I'm going to be working some more on uh, developing, you know, a course on the government's authorities, powers and contracts. And I'll really get in depth into that and show how they use that. Um, but I think for the deliverance aspect, you know, we have to understand that they have books within those books um, all those books will be marked with seals. Um, you know, the, the triangle or uh, one of the triangles or the triangles overlapping in that sign of Israel are the seals that you'll see most commonly used. Um, but another one that you will see is what they're going to deem as the winding road. But really what that winding road is, is it's the snake. They call it the path less taken, right? Um, and, you know, we see that later used even by Hitler himself. Um, you know, it will look like on the graves, you'll see like what looks like a money sign with the three, uh, the three columns through it. And it could go the other direction too, you know, where it looks more like the S with the three money signs. That represents both their military and the Luciferian, you know, the S or the road represents Lucifer. Um, it also represents the very first name that Masons learn to say, which is ha mef hor -hash. Um, and the pillars represent the different principality contracts. We actually see, you'll see a half one because it represents a throne, but in Ashtaros uh, sigil, you see the three columns and you see a double contract there representing that she has a contract with uh, Leviathan and two other main principalities and these poles you know we know the ball the astroth pole right but it also goes back to these three columns which deal with the 72 demonic names 
the keys of Solomon that he summoned and represent their military structure. Mm. So, you know, what is this? It represents the Lebensborn or those who are the seed of Satan who rule over his, his trifold um, demonic army. That's wow. what that literally means. So who holds those keys, you know, to understand all those interconnections? It's the Kabbalah or the Golden Dawn. <clears throat> so we'll see a lot of that. And, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot more coming forward about that. And how do you remove contracts? Uh, that's what we're going to get into in the next uh in a, uh coming up on riding the storms we're going to literally walk through a deliverance um one of the things real quick that i kind of just want to briefly go through as people are preparing for that let's pull up that um that resource that we did so we put together um a deliverance for those who have been part of the Golden Dawn. And in that, we kind of grouped it into sections. Um, you know, it's important to understand that the Golden Dawn goes by different names. So you may see it as Order of the Golden Dawn, which is, you know, what I commonly call it. Uh, you also have it called the Hermetic Order. It also is called the Order Hermeticus Aurorae Aurora. So you may see the Aurorae Aurora um, that as well, or the sign of, of the double, uh, double. You also, ironically, because they're always coding stuff, right? It also can be seen as the triple A. And why would that be? Because that would represent the three pillars that go back to, you know, what they're going to, um, the keys that they're going to be teaching. Um, so, you know, the first thing you want to do when you're doing the deliverance is look at what were the different names that you were associated under because those they're going to establish as a head covering or a headship over you. So whatever names you called that system or that secret society or that circle group that you were a part of those. And if there was more than one, each of those is going to be a headship that you placed yourself under within the system. Uh, each of those have, you know, a governing body. Um, they have people that are in that place of headship and authority over you, uh, known as teachers or could be grandmasters, grandmistresses, uh, mothers, um, matrons, fathers or patrons that you put yourself under. Um so the so the first thing you look at is those headships. Uh, the second thing that we're going to look at as we do the deliverance is we're going to renounce that code of silence and remove its authority and permission over us. Uh, we're going to renounce any secret passwords, uh, signs, symbols, or tokens, whether physical or spiritual. So those are things you want to look at. What were you given? Um, you know, those passwords can be given in secret. It can be a name of a being, a new name of God that they give, uh, the pronun correct pronunciation of things. Like it could be, you know, this hypoth hypothetic oath that you take. Um, with that, usually they'll do seals on your forehead. Uh, those can be done physically where they're taking ashes um, or, you know, and drawing those symbols, whatever they are, or they could be, um, you know, literally 
placing a seal over your head, they could actually use the scripture itself when they do that um, as a sign of the spade or death that they, you know, put on your forehead. Um, you know, when you when they do that, you're swearing an oath. They also could draw the symbol on the palm of your hand, and then you place your hand on the Bible or the word, uh, meaning that there's an oath there. Uh, but if that, you know, is not the sign of Jesus, which is, you know, it's not going to be, they're not going to use the, um, you know, the nail holes, you know, so they'll use a different sign or sigil uh, when they take those oaths. Um, so those are places where they could be. They also could you know, some of us have been through ceremonies where they would uh, have a bowl of water and they would cast an image of your spirit uh, or your physical body on that water. And then using blood, um, they would tattoo or imprint um, upon your image on the water, those signs or seals or sigils on your body. Or, mm. you know, it might be a written word, but it's not going to show up on your physical body. It's, um, they call that soul imprinting, which is basically like tattooing your soul. Um, they commonly will do that uh, with the 72 keys, where they will um, have three children stand together and they literally will imprint the uh, couple scripture verses on your body. Uh, those three verses actually represent the, um, the, the 72 uh, letters together, which represent the name of God and um, represent those three columns. So, you know, they can actually imprint that on to souls and, mm -hmm have all 72 demonic spirits represented on your body. Um, so, you know, sometimes they'll do that to create those, try to create those doorways, those openings to those spirits. Um, then they'll seal those either with fire, water, or blood, or a combination of all three. So, you know, they'll, They'll start like a fire and they'll have blood on there and water and it will be sealed on your soul. That's how they do it. So those symbols that they use also represent a threefold cord that can't easily be broken, which is why they'll do it on three different children. Or you'll see the three columns. It represents that threefold cord. Um, the main you know, we went over the sigil, the main uh, principality that holds those threefold cord treaties is Ashtaroth. Um, so she um, she has those. And then, um, so then we want to make sure that like, you know, renouncing any forms of altars that they used, any false laws. Um you know, when they use Old Testament scriptures and write those on your body, that is a form of, of using God's word falsely and creating a false law because God didn't create, you know, or continue to allow those 72 uh, principal or spirits, um, you know, that the keys of Solomon speak of, he didn't give them that authority he gave it to his those who were his kingdom of priests under jesus christ those who are part of the true order of melchizedek under jesus christ that's who the authority is given to his sons the other ones you know those powers and authorities um that are trying to keep authority in those areas they were cast down you know they lost that heavenly connection to the authority um so they no longer have that and therefore they you know it's a false law if it's kept um 
that's also partly why they claim the emerald tablets and the law written on the emerald tablet, because that emerald represents the stone um, that Lucifer had that Michael uh, struck out of his breastplate when he was cast down. So they've literally written the false law on the emerald tablets. We know that um, the true law that God wrote with his own finger from, you know, a stone that came from Mount Sinai. So I think it was Mount Sinai, right? I may I have think that's, yeah, okay, well, that, Mount yeah, that's a, yep. Um, and that was the other half of the mountain, you know, Mount Sinai is twofold. You have the one side that has the, it has like three tall peaks in it. And those peaks um, are really rocky and ledgy. That was the side that Moses first went up when he saw God in the burning bush. Now the other side is kind of like hilly and has these beautiful hills and it's got the four rivers flowing out of it. That was the side that God led Israel to, which is called Mount Sinai, uh, where he spoke to them from the cloud and where they said, you know, don't speak to us anymore. You're too scary. Your voice is too great for us. So um, it's interesting that you have some, some connections with that. Uh, but we see the Emerald Tablets, you have that both um, used it, in Mormonism, as well as Kabbalah, Masonry, and you also have it in the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. So they use that across the board. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is, you know, we talked about the establishment of these four altars uh, based directionally. And each of those altars have a name and represent a different abyss. So like you have the throne of the east, which is over here, um, is called the guardian of the dawning of the sun. Um, that's also considered the abyss of height. And then you have uh, the throne in the west here, uh, which is Harry's twilight. That's the abyss of depth. Uh, you have the throne of the north, which they call um, Solistus. Uh, the guardian of the cauldron. Now think about that. Like if you have that throne up here in the north, right? What is, what shape do we see below? We see the cup or the V, right? The chalice. So that's why they have the north being the guardian of the cauldron, uh, the well of water of cold and moisture, because literally it represents the headship over the cup. Um, that's the abyss of the north. And then you have uh, the throne of the south, with, which is Deduchus, uh, the guardian of the lake of fire and the burning bush and the abyss of the south. So those they literally will directionally sit in those seats, establishing that altar as also as a throne. Uh, so that's going to be your grand high priestesses who will make these covenants and vows in your area and you may even have some high priests or priestesses who engage in these as well but they'll sit in each of those seats uh they also will sacrifice on it as an altar to seal uh that place of headship there and then um they will align this with the planetaries uh so with the different you'll have the nine planets and uh, they will align it with that, uh, taking universal authority. And that authority will also be connected to um, Zodiac authority, uh, both of the regular Zodiac, the Chinese Zodiac, and the Egyptian Zodiac. Uh, also giving them authority in the areas of astrology. So the sign uh, the, over the stars, uh, the movement of those stars and the harvest of those stars, which includes the time, the seasons, the events. And in that, you'll see them creating the false houses through those zodiacs, also connecting false gates and storehouses. 
um, we're going to also cover some of their books that they um, connect to. So in that, you know, their main books are The Cipher, uh, The Cipher Yitzura, uh, which is going to be their base book. Uh, you have the Book of Formation, which is going to be marked with that S that we talked about here uh, with a path. Um, <clears throat> then you have <clears throat> the Book of the Dead, which is going to be, as you get higher, they're going to literally be, you know, learning embalming as well as, you know, sealing people into death and what they believe is later raising people in that death to life. Um, you know, so it's different than the work that Christ does where he literally raises us into a new life. You know, they're trying to uh, be gods over that. And then you have four books that literally are titled The Abyss of the North, The Abyss of the South, The Abyss of the East, and The Abyss of the West. Uh, but mostly, you know, you're not going to see those unless you're grand high priest or priestess and above. Um, those books are, you know, held by someone and, uh, you know, the everything within that, if you were to see one of those books, um, you know, you would just see empty pages. So only those who have the key to open those books would see what's written within those. Um, but just in case we have any grand high priests or priestesses in the system who want to come out, um, we've got the deliverance. We're going to cover it all uh, in the next session for you. Um, then we're going to work through renouncing some of the mystical things, including, you know, the authority and permissions of uh, the false Horus as Horus, as well as uh, Kevin Paquette. Uh, some of the words that they use, the Aleutian mysteries, um, which deal with the light uh, and the rays of light. Uh, also the staff of Curix, uh, the, what they consider the heart of God, uh, the hidden knowledge, the keys, um, and the imagery of the serpent symbolized by winding roads and straight and narrow between us. Um, also the things connected to con the final consecration of equilibrium that they go through, uh, that would be done with two individuals, one representing the Holy Trinity triangle and the other representing the unholy Trinity triangle. Um, and you would have that both in the physical as well as the spiritual realm, um, you know, where they're going to kind of invert um you know how we perceive things on the physical but then they're also going to add in you know demonic revels which um you know it's going to be a ritual that includes uh sexual exploitation um and then make sure you're renouncing your your ritual name that was given to you or they would also call it your motto or your mottos you could have more than one um, and cover everything with the blood of Christ and the word of his testimony that you serve the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we'll we'll go over that and um, we'll have some verses of authority that you can declare and proclaim. Um, that's part of why I went through explaining, you know, the true headship of Jesus Christ, because that's important to understand in this that you have to give back you know you have to receive jesus christ as your lord and give that headship back to him in order to be free from the false headships that they've set up um, within the brotherhood and the golden dawn and the rosicrucians the different orders that uh, go along with these teachings so we'll cover that in the next one. Uh, Tracy, would you like to cover us in prayer as we closed? Thank you, Father, for the understanding and the wisdom that goes along with it so that we can move forward without any kind of fear, but that we can move forward in faith with the authority that we have 
been given by you with that full understanding of what is our true inheritance so that we can expand the kingdom so we can announce to others that we have a king he's amazing and he loves his subjects and he doesn't want to put us under his foot but he wants to have a sit next to him on his throne of grace so god we thank you Bless Jesse for sharing this with all of us too, Lord, in a way that we can get it and for uh, her courage and mapping it out on a whiteboard too for us, Lord, so we have something that we can see and identify and then recognize. So I thank you, Lord, and we bless all of those that are listening in Jesus's name that they will receive the understanding, the revelation, and be able to share with others and do what it is that you've called us to do. In Jesus's name, amen. Amen. Remember, next time on Sunday, get ready because that's when Jesse will take everybody through the deliverance from the Golden Dawn.